All right, well, this evening we're going to look at the next section. We'll be concluding um, Luke chapter 1. You know, Luke doesn't have as many chapters as uh, Matthew. I think it's four chapters less. But these chapters are quite long. <laughs> I mean, we're, this will be two weeks in chapter 1. We're going to read uh, verses 57 through verse 80. So there are a lot of verses in uh, chapter 1. So let's look at this passage this evening. We'll begin by reading it, and then we'll try to cover uh, as much as we can um, in, in this. So beginning in verse 57. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, His name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant that us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Well, may the Lord bless his uh, word to our edification, to our being built up uh, in Christ uh, this evening. Now, this morning, remember, we saw <clears throat> Mary <clears throat> going to uh, rejoice with Elizabeth and to tell her the good news of what the Lord had done for her. So rejoicing, the gift that God had given to her, but also wanting to share the good news that she had, that she was going to bear the Messiah. And, of course, um, we saw that Elizabeth, it was revealed to her by the Holy Spirit. We also saw John uh, actually uh, leap for joy before he was born because uh, being renewed and filled with the Holy Spirit, he was overjoyed that Jesus Christ was near. And again, this is a, um, an exception. This isn't the rule, but it is interesting. The Lord can save. He can save whomever he wills, even children in the womb. We saw Elizabeth, also filled with the Holy Spirit, speak what he had revealed to her, that Mary was blessed because she had been chosen to carry the Messiah and then we also saw Mary's Magnificat, you know, her exaltation of the Lord for choosing someone who was as worthless as she was to fulfill his promise to Abraham and to bring her Savior into the world. And by the way, when Mary considers herself to be, herself to be worthless, it doesn't mean that she was any worse than anyone else. As a matter of fact, she was uh, righteous like Zacharias and uh, Elizabeth, which is why the Lord chose her. But she was only that way because of the grace of God. And that thought should always humble us. Apart from the Lord, uh, we 
would be lost forever. Now tonight we see the fulfillment of the Lord's promise to Zacharias. John is born. And we see Zacharias' prophecy regarding the Messiah and his son who would prepare his way. Now, first of all, we see the fulfillment of the Lord's promise to Zacharias to, to give him a son. In verse 57, we read that when the time was completed, Elizabeth gave birth to a son as the Lord had promised. And when her neighbors and relatives heard about how the Lord had mercy on her, uh, we read that they also rejoiced with her. Again, it's, it's appropriate when the Lord has mercy on, on, on anyone that, that we know or on us that we rejoice together for God's mercy. And then we read that when it was the eighth day, her neighbors and her relatives came together in order to circumcise him. Now, we know that the law required that this circumcision take place on the eighth day, and something that may not be as obvious, and perhaps it was a matter of the Jewish tradition, when the circumcision took place, there needed to be at least 10 witnesses who were present for the circumcision. So they came together to, to do this right. Uh, they came together to obey the law of God, but they also came together that there might be the requisite number of witnesses. Now, according to the Jewish law, anyone could have performed this ritual, at least within Israel, a priest, a Levite, or a layman. The father or the mother could have done it, or a relative or a friend, didn't matter whether it was a man or a woman. The only person who couldn't do it was a Gentile, and I think that was for uh, obvious reasons. But the father was the one who usually did this, and he would have done it in this case, Zacharias would have, except for one thing. The person who performed this rite also had to be the one to pronounce the blessing. Okay? There was a blessing that came with circumcision. And if it was the father, he was to say this, Blessed are you, O Lord our God the king of the world, who has sanctified us by his precepts and has commanded us to enter him into the covenant of Abraham, our father. So, you know, the child being born within, you know, the covenant community would be then brought into this covenant made with Abraham. I will be a God to you and to your seed after you. The father was to pronounce this blessing. Well, the problem here, of course, was that Zacharias couldn't speak, which means that he would not be able to do this. And, and thinking about this, this may be the one blessing that Zacharias missed out on because of the Lord's discipline. Remember, he struck him dumb so he couldn't speak because he doubted what Gabriel told him was going to happen. Now, remember that the Lord disciplined Zacharias. He disciplines us because he loves us, not because he hates us, not because he's bringing about retribution or justice. Jesus has received all the, the penalty of the law, all the justice, uh, his wrath upon himself so that we might be delivered from it. But it doesn't save us from discipline, and it shouldn't, because this discipline is for our good. But we also, I think, need to learn from this that our sins can still cost us, right? Uh, we can learn from the sins that we commit but we can also lose from those sins. And I think Zacharias, in this case, lost something. Now, it was also customary, though apparently wasn't required by the law of God, to name the child when this rite was performed. So when the time came to name him, they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But Elizabeth, of course, knowing what the angel had said, answered in verse 60, no, indeed, but he shall be called John. Well, they objected. Why would you call him John? No one in your family is, is called by that name. That's not how we do things around here, okay? It says they were amazed, right, that they would do this. And I, I think the amazement comes from this. Now, you've heard this, the saying, you know, we, we don't do it that way. We've never done it that way. Uh, sometimes we need to learn to be a, a bit more flexible, okay? Uh, 
especially in a case like this, when the Lord specifically told them what he wanted the child's name to be. So they turned to Zacharias to see what he thought, and asking for a tablet, he wrote on it, his name is John. And this is where they were amazed, okay? Amazed. Why were they amazed? Well, that he, they were amazed that he would break with tradition. Now, tradition is, you know, you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, tradition, how it gets ingrained in the Jewish culture, and not just the Jewish culture, but also our culture, that he would introduce a new name into the family. There's nobody in, in the whole, you know, the whole, a whole uh, family, extended family that has that name. Why would you call him that? Well, it's because of the Lord's command. But it's also interesting to note here that when that took place, when the name was given, it was then that the word of the Lord through Gabriel was fulfilled. Remember, he told Zacharias, your wife Elizabeth is going to conceive a son, and he shall be called John. When Zacharias doubted, Gabriel said to him, in verse 20 of Luke 1, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. You know, the Lord has said it. There's no doubt it's going to take place. It's going to happen. And when it happens, you know, actually up until the time it happens, you won't be able to speak. Now that the child had, had been born, eight days later, being circumcised, now that he's being uh, named, or now that he has been named John, the discipline was over. Zacharias could speak again. And we read in verse 64, and at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he began to speak in praise of God. You know, if, if uh, Neva were here, she would remember that uh, Dick, her husband, who's with the Lord, uh, used to often pray this prayer that as receivers of gifts, we should be <clears throat> givers of thanks or givers of, of praise. And that's exactly what Zacharias is doing here, isn't he? He had been given the gift of a son in his old age. He had learned some valuable lessons through God's discipline. And so also realizing that this child was to be the forerunner of the Messiah, a very uh, precious gift uh, of a child, he praised the Lord. So he was very happy. He was overjoyed. He was blessing God for this mercy. But we should also note here that for the other people who were standing around watching what was going on, it had just the opposite effect on them, as well as those who were living around who heard what was going on. They became afraid because they realized the Lord was at work. Remember, whenever the Lord displays His, His power, it, it strikes fear, amazement. People marvel. It means that you know, they're, they're filled with wonder and awe and fear because they know that God is present. And the purpose of these miracles is to make people stop and pay attention. And fear often has that effect. They began talking about this throughout the hill country of Judea, wondering what this child would turn out to be because God was certainly with him. But now the Lord had actually another reason for giving Zacharias his voice back at that particular moment. With all these people gathered together and now paying attention to Zacharias because they were afraid of what was going on, the fear of the Lord had filled them, Zacharias, now filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to prophesy. And he tells us something about first the Messiah, and then he tells us something about how his son is going to be involved. He actually speaks to John and, and says, you child, this is what you're going to do, even though he wouldn't be able to understand that. And we, under, we know that that was for the benefit of those who are around him. So first of all, he speaks about the Messiah, how the Messiah would be the fulfillment of the promise made to David. Now, as we look at this prophecy again, it reads very much like a, a psalm, doesn't it? If this were in the psalms, I think we, would, we wouldn't blink. We would We'd say, yes, this is what a psalm sounds like. This is what it looks like. But here, I think Zacharias, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is doing what we often see New Testament writers doing, and particularly in the book of Revelation, and that is using Old Testament imagery, 
to speak of the blessings that the Messiah was bringing. Okay? So even though it sounds like an Old Testament text, and in many ways it is, it's going to be fulfilled in a new covenant way, in a spiritual way. So first of all, he, he blesses God for visiting his people in his mercy and bringing about or accomplishing their redemption. You know, it's interesting he speaks about this in the past tense. He speaks about it as though it's something that's already, that's already done. And as a matter of fact, it, it was already in a certain sense done. It was so certain to take place that God had already been giving the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ back, all the way back to Adam and Eve. He was applying this because it was so certain to take place. As far as God is concerned, this is something that he had determined to do, and so he was going to do it. Nothing can stop the Lord from accomplishing his purposes, which is very encouraging because if he's promised to keep you until the day of Jesus Christ and to bring you safely into heaven, if you've trusted in his son, that's exactly what he's going to do, and nothing can stop him. Zacharias connected, notice, this redemption to God's promise to, to David. He says, God has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of David in verse 69. You know, a horn is often used in Scripture, and it's not talking, I think, about the kind you blow, but rather like a, a symbol of strength, a symbol of might that a mighty animal might have, for instance. It's often used to refer to strength. It also refers to royal dignity and, and power. And what uh, Zacharias is saying here is that the Lord has raised up a king from David's line who is going to bring salvation. The promised king whose kingdom he would establish and the kingdom that would last forever. Which is why, of course, if we're a part of that kingdom through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we too will reign with him forever. This is the one Zacharias says that, that God has been promising through his prophets from ancient times who would deliver his people from their enemies. <clears throat> you know, when we read passages like this, we, we kind of wonder, especially because of the disciples and what they said to Jesus just before he ascended in Acts chapter 1. Lord, is it now that you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? Uh, perhaps they were still looking for a political Messiah rather than a spiritual Messiah, and it's possible that Zacharias and those listening may have understood what he was saying politically. Now, this just reminds us that prophets don't always understand what it is they're prophesying about. They don't have necessarily a perfect knowledge. Remember what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. As to this salvation... The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. There were certain things they understood about the prophecies they were given, but they weren't given full knowledge regarding this. And Zacharias, though he was prophesying, may not have fully understood this in the way that we understand it, the way we know the Lord meant it, because we have the rest of the New Testament, and we know what it is that Jesus came to do. The Lord intended not to deliver us necessarily from physical enemies, such as uh, Israel being delivered from the Romans, or as he delivered them from all the different enemies in, in the, old, the, the Old Testament, but rather he meant this spiritually. Jesus came to deliver us from our spiritual enemies, from the devil, from the world that he is largely in control of, from our flesh. He came to deliver us from death. He came to deliver us from damnation, which is what would have been ours outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Zacharias connected this to the God's fulfillment of his promise to, to David. He also connects it to his fulfillment to, or to the promise he made to Abraham. In verses 72 and 73, he says, To show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father. And this simply just is to remind us that, that Jesus is the fulfillment 
of everything that God has promised in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. And remember, the Old Covenant and the Old Testament don't completely overlap. The Old Covenant is the covenant God made through, through Moses, right? But every covenant that God has given that had to do with redemption, all of those things are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. He is uh, the, you know, the, the seed of Abraham through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He is the son of David, as we've seen, the, the horn of salvation he's raised up in the house of David. He is the one who brings about the blessings of the new covenant. So the entire Old Testament is essentially pointing to Jesus. He is that fulfillment. He is the one who is going to deliver us from our enemies. He is the one who has delivered us from our enemies. But I want you to notice also Zacharias talks about the reason why the Lord is delivering his people from their enemies. In verse 74, that being rescued by him, they, we, might serve him without fear all of our days. And this is to remind us that Jesus did not save us only to make us safe. We're thankful that he did, and we are safe if we've trusted Jesus. But he saved us that we might serve him, serve him without fear from these enemies that he has overcome. The Lord Jesus has overcome all of our enemies through the blood of his cross. Remember, in, in his crushing the head of the servant, he himself would be bruised. He would die and he would be buried, and on the third day, he would be raised again. This also reminds us that he did not free us from our greatest enemy, which is sin, that we might now feel free to sin, that we might now submit again to sin and become slaves of sin, but he freed us that we might serve him in holiness and righteousness all our days. And again, we understand how that fits into the whole picture. He saved us to become like Jesus, who served him in holiness and righteousness all his days. So that's what he says about Messiah. And then secondly, Zacharias turns to John to tell him, this little infant who was just born, how he would be involved, prophesying over him. He says in verse 76, And you, child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways. So in other words, John, you will be the prophet of the Messiah. You will be his spokesman. You will be his representative. I'm going, it, the Lord is going to send you, and, and again, notice whose representative that he is here. He is the Lord. He is the prophet of the Most High who will go before the Lord to prepare his way. And that's who Jesus Christ is. He is the Most High God. He is Yahweh. He is the covenant God of Israel. John the Baptist is his prophet who is being sent to prepare him as he is coming now to uh, minister in Israel. Now, John's job would be, uh, again, to prepare his way. And he would do this by preaching. He would expose their sins by declaring the law of God and pointing out specifically how they're breaking that law. He would warn them about God's judgment that was going to come on them for breaking the law of God. And the reason he was doing that was not just to be a whip on their backs to, to punish and penalize them, but rather he was doing this to wake them up so that they might see their need of the one who was coming after him. That is how he was preparing the way. And of course, he not only preached the law and repentance and judgment. He was also there to point to Jesus, to tell them who Jesus was when he actually came so that when he came, they would know who it was they were to trust in order that they might receive God's forgiveness. So God in his mercy uh, was about to send his son and uh, again, this, this sun he represents as basically like the sun rising. The sun of righteousness was about to rise upon them, which is a reference to Old Testament imagery. You know, uh, they were sitting in the land, the shadow of darkness, the shadow of death. They basically were in sin. Uh, 
in the, well, the, the darkness of sin, they were in the darkness of ignorance, they were in the darkness of death, and upon them, Jesus is about to rise. And so John is going out to prepare the way for them. Uh, Jesus was about to rise in order that he might guide them, he says, into the way of peace, that they might be reconciled with God, not through the law, but rather through the blood of his cross. Um, John tells us in uh, John chapter 1, verse 9, that Jesus is the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Uh, he is the one who has come to reveal who God is. He is the one who has come to teach the truth of God, uh, what God is like, uh, what it is that God loves. He's the one who's come to show us um, how to really live like him, how we can be reconciled to him. I mean, Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. So if we want to know the truth, the truth about all these things, the truth about all things God, about God, we need to look to Jesus. We need to come to him. He is the true light or the true source of knowledge about God. And then finally, we see this one last comment in verse 80, that John continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, which could mean the Holy Spirit or essentially in his purpose. Uh, you know, some people are, are, seem to be filled with much more energy and perhaps that's what it had to do with. And he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. I think the most important thing to see about this is, is, is essentially that the Lord separates us from the world in order that he might prepare us uh, for his work. And I think here he, he does this literally with, uh, with John. Uh, during the, um, you know, especially during the ancient and medieval church periods, and I guess even into the modern day, there are those, at least in historic Christian churches that may or may not necessarily be true churches any longer, people would literally withdraw from the world into monasteries, become monks and, and nuns and so forth, in order to be used of the Lord. Well. That's not exactly what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to be separate from the world uh, as far as being separate from their morals and from their influence and so forth and, and to be filled with the Spirit of God, but He wants us to be present in the world so that we can make a difference. He wants us to shine as lights in the world, but sometimes He draws us apart for a while to prepare us for the work that He has for us. And here we see Him separating John that He might prepare him for this very important ministry that the Lord has for him. Well, this, again, is essentially what we see leading up now to uh, the birth of the Messiah. We've seen the Gabriel coming to Elizabeth, or actually to Zacharias, and, and then to Mary to announce the birth of the forerunner of the Messiah and the Messiah. We see Elizabeth prophesying, we see Mary prophesying, we see Zacharias prophesying, all talking about these events. The very next thing we're going to see, of course, is the fulfillment of the second promise six months later, the coming of the Messiah, the birth of the Messiah. So that's what we'll look at um, next week. But for this week, again, let's just try to remember why the Lord has called us out of the world. And that is that we might, like John the Baptist, prepare people to meet the Lord, and that we might, like Jesus, shine the light of his truth in this world. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do that.